Good morning, everybody. This is Mark Dempsey, the CTC. I am showing top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our special CCN webinar on CAE2Y. Uh, we do try to offer special interest webinars like this every fall and spring. Um, this morning, we have as many as 17 schools calling in from 10 states, which is a great turnout. So thanks for joining us. Uh, Anne, do you want to say a few words before I do the housekeeping stuff? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you to Kyle for presenting this for us today. The CAE2Y designation is a very important one uh, in the arena where security is king. So, but it's not a trivial certification to go after. So uh, Kyle is going to give us some guidance on that, and I think it'll be very timely for all of us. Thank you, Kyle. And Debbie is here with us, and we have someone taking notes. Good morning. So just a few um, quick housekeeping notes. Um, we have about 30 people who RSVP'd, so we've muted everybody to keep things running smoothly and, and quietly. Um, but that doesn't mean you're not involved. I'm here on the WebEx chat box. So please send us your comments and your questions. I um, hope everyone had a chance to look over the presentation in advance, come up with some questions. Um, please use that chat box. Um, I will see those and relate it to Kyle. Um, now, sometimes the chat box is not open um, by default, so you may have to like, look for that button at the top and click it open, but it is there. Um, don't use email. We're no one's checking email right now, so just that chat box. Uh, I'm not doing roll call, so we can get going um, quickly, so if you would, um, type your name and your school into the chat box. I can give you credit. I do see some names on the list, but just in case for those who um, I can't see or, I, or aren't on there, um, please just type your name in school so I can give you credit for being here, all right? Um, we are recording the webinar, and I will send you the link afterwards if you want to share it with some colleagues. Um, one last thing. At the end, I'm going to send you a link um, for a survey, a short survey. Um, I will send an email as well. Let's put it in the chat box. Your feedback is an essential part of the reporting that we provide at NSF, all right? So we need to show these webinars are creating an impact, and we need your responses to that survey, okay? Um, I'm now going to hand over to our presenter. Kyle Jones is with St. Clair Community College in Dayton, Ohio. Sinclair is one of the CTC Grants New Partner Schools. Uh, Kyle is an associate professor there and also the chair of the CIS department. And he's our resident expert on the CIE2Y process. So thank you, Kyle, for putting, it together, putting this together for us. Thank I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, take it away. Thank you. Okay. Sounds great. Um, also, can you see the slides and me? I can see you. Can everyone, okay. I, I think you're, and I think, yeah, I can see you too. So those who can open up the, uh, the box, you can see his face as well. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so I was just at a conference um, last week that I've got other material that I didn't get to quite incorporate in, so, you know, I got like medallions that we won and all that kind of stuff. So I was going to talk about those during the process, and I was like, whoa, I kind of need the webcam for this. So, <clears throat> so I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'm super excited to talk about the CAE2Y process. Uh, it's something that um, was handed off to me when I came to Sinclair. We've been a CAE2Y since 2012, and uh, what happened was as our chair stepped down, he actually retired and handed this over to me without me knowing anything about the CAE2Y process. So it. Uh, it has been a learning experience. Um, I actually focused my master's thesis is all focused on the importance of uh, Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity. So I kind of knocked two birds out with one stone where I worked on my master's thesis and uh, redesignating us. Now, the redesignating process is a hundred percent a designation process. You don't really get to uh, reuse any of your old material, um, especially when we went from uh, quarters to semester, so I wasn't able to use anything. I had to rewrite everything from scratch. And that's kind of where I like to approach this, because it's almost like drinking from a fire hose. So I actually want to start off with just a few things. Um, we're going to outline this. I'm going to talk just a little bit about what the CAE2Y is, and I do have on there, it's soon they're going to take away the 2Y. Uh, I just found out about this last Friday. Um, they think that it's currently unfair to call out community colleges as a 2Y. We're still teaching the same cyber defense education as everyone else. So they're actually going to just be calling a Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense Education, just like they would a university. Um, I, I like that. I appreciated that. Um, that's actually what's a part of this new process they have. 
for research institutes and so on, but they are going to be changing it to Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense Education will be the new name. Um, so that'll be great. I also want to talk about resources. There's a lot of resources out there because I don't want you to think when you're listening to this call, because I'm going to cover a lot of stuff. I'm going to cover all of my pain points, the things that I ran into, but I want to start off with all of the help and resources. Uh, the NSA and the National Science Foundation has put a lot of money a lot of money into having resource centers. So I want to make sure I talk about the grants available to help you out and the resource centers. Because when I start getting into program criteria and focused areas, that might be when people start spacing out thinking, man, this is difficult. I do want to mention there are resources and there are places that will help. So I will talk in length about the knowledge units and program criteria. That's the most important thing when we talk about this process is making sure that you're meeting the NSA's program criteria and knowledge units. You might see the word KUs used in there quite a bit. Those KUs are discussed in length. Um, then we'll talk about program criteria and at the end I want to talk about the reasons why you would want to go for this designation. So, what is the CAE2Y? I hope that you guys saw this um, or have an idea about what this is. Like I mentioned before, they're thinking about changing the CAE2Y just to be cyber defense. But the, initially, the whole idea of this is making sure that a program at a college or university is eligible for scholarships and grants through the Department of Defense and Information and Assurance Scholarship Programs. So, Again, that goes back to the importance of this, of why you would want to have this. Okay. With that said, let's talk a little bit. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Mark? Am I loud enough? Yeah, you're good. One person had trouble hearing you, but they hung, hung up and redialed, and it worked fine that time. Okay. So right. You're coming through clear for everyone. Great. So I want to talk just a little bit about the program and the website. Um, and then I'm going to kind of lead into a few things. Uh, the website is itself an acronym that has acronyms inside of it. Yeah, that's the government. So uh, the website is actually um, listed at the bottom of our previous slide. It's the uh, iad.gov slash NIETP. And I just want to demonstrate this here real quick, because when you go to that website, you are going to probably be blocked because most government sites now are freaking out when you go there um, because it's not an HTTPS page and it's, it crashes. So you have to hit accept to go to the next part of that page. So just keep that in mind. That's where you're going to do this entire process. Everything, all the submissions, all of the letters, every inch of this process will be done through that site. So I'm just mentioning that up front. I'm going to come back to it, but please keep that site in mind because that's how you would actually apply. That's where you would apply to be a part of the, uh, the CAE2Y process. It's really simple. All that does is give you access to this page to start implementing things. But essentially, we'll come back to it. That is the very first part of this uh, entire process. All right. So first steps, of course, is going to the IAD.gov's website and is simply making an account. Of course, I've already made an account, so I'm already in mine. But if you're a new school, it's as simple as hitting the join and register. Uh, it's not very difficult. You can always register and then work on your application for years. The, the important thing is would you just to sign up and enroll your institution. That's, that's the first step. Uh, just getting that account made and just getting logged in. I am going to turn my email off so that does not drive us nuts. All right. Cool. And of course, that's where all of our information about requirements and everything are listed on that page. Now, I will come back to the requirements and we'll talk about those more in depth, but there is a requirements page that lists out all of your program requirements. This is just another resource, and I'll touch back on these, but this is a list of requirements. 
All right. So, if you have decided to work on the Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity designation, I can't talk enough about the C5 program. The C5 program right here is a link to the website. The C5 program is a grant-driven program that helps you designate as a CAE. Now, what that does is that gives you a mentor, and that mentor can come out and evaluate your process to review your school, everything. Uh, it's, it is a great process. Uh, me being new to it, of course, I say new to it about two years ago, it helped me with every piece of this. It helped me with finding somebody that's already done this before, even down to somebody that read my entire submission. I think it was close to 155 pages when I was done. Um, when I finally submitted it uh, to be designated, I had a, a person that read over every inch that made sure all of my periods and commas and all of my links worked. They did a great job. This C5 process is amazing. And of course, there's a whole bunch of information in here um, about applying and having somebody assigned to you um, to do this. There's a little bit of funding that comes with this, especially with travel. There's a lot of programs that the, uh, that the NSA puts on that if you need help with knowledge units or if you need help going to a resource center, they will help pay for a lot of your travel. They will also pay for your mentor. So your mentor will actually be paid, not through your school, but through the C5 process. So then you don't have to feel too bad about calling them every other week, asking them for questions, because it's all, they're being paid through this process. All right, and of course, when you get it, uh, you get this lovely medallion. I don't know if you can see my little medallion. I got a picture of it there. Um, that uh, you're a Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity, and of course, it's got the C5 grant stamp on the back of it. Uh, these are what they call challenge coins. Some of you might have Cyber Patriot challenge coins. Um, I really like this, and I'm actually building a, um, a frame for our designation, and I'm going to build that into the frame. I think that would look pretty cool. But it is a great, great thing. And it's simply just that c5colleges.org is the easiest place to get to. Yet again, this is a big process, and I'm just talking about the help in the front of this. The help uh, for this is uh, extremely important because, like I said, sometimes it might feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, so that's why I wanted to put help options here in the front. Also, the NSA has several schools they set up as resource centers. So these are CRRCs, which are resource centers. They are national regional resource centers, so that's why we get so many acronyms here. But if you live in a state that you can see here on our map, you can see how many schools are located in that area. Now, there are more schools, like I just mentioned the conference that I just spoke at. There are more schools. However, there are regionals now. now I'm in Ohio, so my resource center is here in Chicago at Moraine Valley. They are our resource center. So they technically, they get funded separately to be a resource center. Now, like I mentioned again, like I think uh, there's quite a few people from Texas on this call. Texas has got a resource center. So just keep that in mind. Also, there's these regional hubs, which are the resource centers, and I have the names of the colleges laid out. So you can kind of see where your regional center is. Um, we do a lot with our regional center. Um, they actually do uh, quarterly reports. Uh, they've come to Sinclair to help me out with a few things. And I've went up to Moraine Valley to actually speak at some of their events. You can see Moraine Valley is my North Central Resource Center. So I rely on them a lot. And just like I mentioned, there are several, several things that's here in uh, the CAE2Y world that ha can help you with this process. I don't want anybody to think that they're alone working on all these things, but these things, once you leave this call, this is what I you know, am, am trying to stress, that these are really important um, because there's a lot to go with that. Um, I have one more resource I'd like to talk about, 
and then, you know, I might turn it over for questions about resources before I start talking about the designation of the program. Um, another thing is we have the Center of Academic Excellence community page. There is so much information here on the community page. Uh, anything and everything in cybersecurity education is on this page. Everything from webinars to conferences to designated schools, all of that information is located on this page. Um, this page is ran by uh, San Bernardino uh, in Southern California, and it's hosting everything that you would do. So take, for instance, if I do something special in the community, they'll actually post it there. As you can see just on the screenshot that I took, you know, here's educational resource and training. Um, there is so many opportunities of grants and getting faculty trained uh, that this is great. I actually have two faculty members that are going to be doing forensics classes over the summer, and I don't have to pay anything. I don't have to pay their travel, nothing. They're, they're getting fully funded through an opportunity I found on the uh, CAE community page. Cool. Did anybody have any questions with uh, help? These are like my help slides. Not yet. I asked a minute ago, so still quiet on the chat box front. Okay. Feel free, even as I go throughout the rest of this, Mark, if anybody has a question, I'm more than happy to stop. Okay. I'll let you know. Thanks. All right. So the next part is I'd actually like to talk about going through this process. Like I mentioned before, the first part was just about help and things that you can find to help you with this process. I'd actually like to take a start to finish through what a CAE application looks like so you can get an idea of what you need to work on and the time and the effort that it's going to take to go through this process. So this first part, and this is the part that everybody seems to worry about the most, is aligning your knowledge units. Um, I have on here Fred Kaplinger um, is a friend of mine, and he actually wrote uh, this knowledge unit book. I actually have a link down here on the bottom to his newest book. This is actually where he keeps his uh, iterations of his book. And as you can see in here, he's got it broken down by different knowledge unit levels and so on. But this is actually a, a wonderful walkthrough book on starting to finish all the way through. Oops, page not found, of course. Um, I must have clicked on the wrong page. I think this is what I wanted. Yes. So it's got all of his books and everything laid out in here. Uh, it is a great resource to have uh, because he walks you through how to do it, the importance, ways to think about it, and so on. Remember, the National um, Security Agency and Department of Homeland Security has broken down for two-year institutions 11 core required knowledge units. That means you have to find classes in your degree program that cover basic data analysis, basic scripting, cyber defense, cyber threats, fundamental security design principles, um, information assurance fundamentals, um, IT systems, networking concepts, policy, legal, and ethics, and system administration. So you have to have classes that meet these core requirements. Now, these are the core requirements, but inside of each of these core requirements are actually several different pieces that are focused. So basic data analysis has like 10 pieces that you have to say it's covered in this chapter, in this homework, or it's in this project or it's covered in this video, or if it's covered in this extra resource. Every single one of those have to be mapped back to the knowledge unit. So before we go forward, I just want to mention the classes that I used. I only used four. 
I feel like the fewer amount of classes that you can map your knowledge units to, the better. So I use uh, Network Plus, Security Plus, knocked out a bunch of those. And we are a very uh, Windows system secure administration here at Sinclair. And I picked a Windows Server class, and we actually have a Windows Network Security class. Those four classes met the entire institutional required knowledge units. So essentially on the education side, I made those four classes uh, a short-term certificate and then added that short-term certificate in all of our cybersecurity degrees. Therefore, all of the students taking those degrees automatically get our Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity short-term certificate, which is really cool because it's a, it's a plaque and it's got the uh, NSA and Department of Homeland Defense logos on it that we hand out to students. But the fewer classes you have, I feel like the easier it is. Now, I did have to design a couple more homeworks and add a few extra pieces, but you'd actually be amazed about how much those core concepts and Network Plus, Security Plus. Um, I even had schools do uh, the CCNA security and just Cisco curriculum actually covers a lot of these principles. Now, when you get into basic scripting, that can be more challenging. Um, our basic scripting, we use PowerShell, but we already use PowerShell in our server classes. so it was able to check those boxes easy. But it's just something that you need to think through for that process. All right. Um, I added some links in here. Uh, so instead of recreating the wheel, I thought I would take a look at these approaches. Um, I'll a question. Yeah. Sure. Can you say what the classes were again, your four classes that you map all those KUs to? Yeah. Uh -huh. To make it easier, I'm going to jump out to our uh, page here. We have a CAE2Y page, and here's my short-term certificate. And here's, um, so Sinclair doesn't allow hidden prerequisites. So this class is not, this 1107 Intro to Operating Systems is not in my certification track. It's, it's just required as a short-term certificate because it's a, uh, it's a prereq to other classes. So our classes is Network Fundamentals, which is Network Plus. That's, that's our uh, Align Network Plus class. Windows Server Operating Systems. So this is your standard, um, they just changed the uh, test number. It's like 80, 750. I have the book uh, on my shelf somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's um, it's one of those numbers. It's for the Microsoft Windows Server operating systems first level class that that's aligned to the Microsoft Windows Server uh, certification. 2630 is actually aligned to the Secure PowerShells book that is. Um, kind of a hefty book. I don't know if you can see it here, but it's uh, Security Power Tools for Windows Servers. Um, it's, uh, it's a great class because this covers all of the scripting and everything that students would need to do for servers. And then in 2640, that's our Security Plus class. So, hey, Kyle, so if for server 2016, is it 70-740? Is that the thing you're thinking yes. of? Okay. Yeah, that's it, yeah. You know, and we use the um, Wiley MOAC Labs, and that, that just about hit everything in that server operating systems class. I mean, it, it, it hammered out half of a, one of the knowledge units, just the class alone. Now, that's, that's how we did it. Every institution is different. And there's this whole methodology with a lot of the people that write the KUs. There's actually a group of people that get together and identify and design the KUs. And they're kind of doing it this way, just so everybody doesn't have the exact same classes. You know, I did it with Windows Server classes. Other people did it with maybe a Red Hat class. Uh, some people, I again, used um, the Cisco 
curriculum instead of the Network Plus. Uh, some of them use the, the uh, CCNA security instead of the Security Plus. Um, but we are very focused on servers here. At Sinclair, we have a whole server track and everything. And we just found that those check the boxes the easiest. But not all the schools do that. Uh, when I talk to a lot of schools, we're kind of the few that did the Windows servers. I thought it was easier, but we had already developed it. The curriculum and it was already just kind of sitting there. Just kind of had to go through and check the boxes. I hope that answered the question. Does that make sense? I think that was good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, they, they say yes. Okay. And, and when I start looking at the knowledge units, hopefully you can start making the connection between what class I already have and how that meets the knowledge units. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into my uh, NIETP page so, like, you can see how I wrote it and how I aligned it. And, and I'm hoping that, that you viewing it will make it easier, you know, when we discuss these things. I, I think I... So I sit back and I wish that somebody would have done that for me because I went around in circles for weeks, I felt like. <clears throat> so um, I converted all of these uh, to Google Docs and um, I think I have all these built in. I literally just got these from Fred on Friday of last week. Uh, so Fred was here in Dayton. I'm in Dayton, Ohio. Um, Dayton hosted these uh, Center of Academic Excellence and Cybersecurity uh, Principal Investigators Conference, as well as the National Institute of Standards and Technology um, Nice NIST Framework Conference. Why it couldn't have been in Southern California, I don't know, but it was here in Dayton, Ohio, where it froze rain for the entire week that everybody was here. Um, but Fred did a great job breaking these down into three parts. So this is kind of the progress that Fred and other people at uh, other organizations and at the National Institute of Standards and Technology would like people to walk through. So this really comes down to mapping out your knowledge units. So take for instance, Fred kind of breaks these down into different topics and different ideas, but gathering your information is extremely important. He uh, has put together a knowledge unit mapping matrix. So I want to talk about it just for a second and then I'll, I'll give my kind of honest opinion about it. The way that it's broken down is it's, it's in an Excel document. And essentially you look at your topics and you align your classes, you put them in this field, and then you talk about how you hit basic security in these outcomes. Honestly, I was extremely confused by this Excel document. Some people like it. I personally did not. Um, I thought it was kind of confusing to walk through this, but the idea is, as you see just where they have check marks there, it's just going out and trying to find what courses meet all of this curriculum. I mean, you could do this on pencil and paper if you wanted. Um, you know, you could put all of your classes in this Excel document and then put all the check marks in the right places and then go back and only use those classes. I think if I was a large university and I was looking at like 10 or 15 classes and I was trying to narrow down what I wanted to use, I think I would have used this document, but, you know, I, I probably have five classes that I knew off the top of my head that I wanted to use, and it only took about a couple hours of reading over the course knowledge units. I narrowed down which classes I was going to use. Um, that's just me. Now, so some other schools might have more classes they want to use, or they might have 50 classes. And using this walkthrough, again, you would put your class up here, and then you basically would check the boxes whether you think it would meet those requirements. What Fred is trying to do is trying to save you time on the end by saying, hey, let's map out every class in your department 
and let's see the one that has the most X's and start from there. It's a great concept, it's a great idea, but I felt like jumping in and, and working through my process directly on the NIETP page felt quicker uh, and I was able to get more done, but that's just me. I, I don't, I guess I don't think in these patterns. Um, so that's the first part. So that's just information and data gathering. Also, please feel free to jump back out and check these out. Um, I got the okay from Fred. He wants these pushed out to many schools as he can possibly get them out to. He really, really, really wants these uh, used. Okay. Uh, he's got walkthroughs on the page about how to uh, establish your school. Again, if you go to the NIETP webpage and you enroll, he's got how to enroll into Watts, you know, uh, institution and so on. This is the first part that you have to do in order to get access into the NIETP page. This is the first step of the first walkthrough. This is kind of what I was showing earlier, but mentioning what I was going to come back to. He's got a great walkthrough on how to log in, select your institution, and actually put start putting together requirements, and so on. All right. That brings me down to the second part of this. <clears throat> Once you've identified your courses, all you have to do is enter your course in this page. Now, if a lot of you guys are good at databases, this is just simply a large database. This database just links information back when you start filling out other information. So the more you fill out, the easier it will be later. Um, I made the mistake of scarcely entering in information and then having to go back and put information back in. All right. So, of course, when you add a course, it's very simple. Course number, title, uh, course creation date. Um, we keep track of all of our course creation dates here at Sinclair, especially when we do upgrades and programs. That's easy to put together. And of course, our class description is literally just right off the internet. Uh, we wanted to keep everything standard. So. That's entering in a course, and then um, there are several different things that you can enter in for your course. You can pick multiple of these. Of course, you know, we did chapter reviews, weekly quizzes, labs, exams, so on. Um, you know, you just check all that apply, and then you submit a syllabus. Yep, and then you have your uh, class submitted. From there, you start adding in topics. Now, um, to put this simply, I, I hope that most of you would align the classes you pick to industry certifications. Um, I don't know if anybody's opened up a certification book. In the first couple pages, it has topics and outcomes already listed on your page. I'm looking for a certification book just to show an example real quick. Um, I hope everybody's kind of familiar with that because that's essentially all you're doing when you're putting these course and topics in. They're already been identified and outlined by the company. Take for instance, here is my, it's just a Windows 7 class and they've already broken things down into, I don't know if you can see this into topics and outcomes. So of course, all of my topics, since we used the book, all we had to do was type in topic number, chapter one, major topic, <laughs> the title of the chapter, the description. It's normally that first paragraph of the textbook, you know, whether it's in your textbook or not, or supplemental information. And then so on. And then the rest of these can be drop downs from information that you've already entered. They can make it very simple. And then the same with an objective. 
uh, the objectives were like the small bullet points, so topic, objective, and so on. That's what makes this easy when you're ever filling out information that has to do with a an industry certification, because you can just align it to industry certifications. All right. Uh, essentially, here's just the same information, just kind of filled out. So they're, you know, given the name, you know, the title, and so on. Okay. This is a great process. And then this looks what it looks like when it's done. It kicks you out a nice little report for you to read over. Like I said, I'll jump into mine so I can actually show you what it looks like on the website. All right. Now, you have to enter in all of your topics, all of your, um, you know, chapter titles and your courses before you even start to map. Right, because basically you want to enter in the class and the book and all of its information. So when you start adding it, your mapping in, it starts to fill out all of the information for you. Like I said before, it's easier to go through and spend more time entering in your textbook, your topics, your objectives, and your outcomes. Because when you start filling out the website, it makes it easy. So, take for instance, uh, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, Fred adds a couple jokes into his slides. Uh, this is where people start pulling their hair out, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, as you can see, here's all these flow charts, here's all of these examples of, of what you can do, the match requirements, and so on. But there is fairly easy ways to do these knowledge units. So as I mentioned before, if you are a CAE 2Y school, you are required to map to all of these. All of these 11, you are required. You can pick other options right here to map to. Now, and, and I want to mention this. So let's take, for instance, you have a forensics program. You can be a center of academic excellence focusing on forensics. That's what those optional knowledge units are for. Take, for instance, I'm here in Ohio. Um, there's only four other CAE schools in Ohio, so I really don't have a lot of competition here in Ohio. Now, let's say if there was like 10 other CAE schools right next to me, I might want to think about adding uh, an, an additional knowledge unit so I can specialize in something. So you can say, oh, yeah, we're all Center of Academic Excellence schools, but we're a Center of Academic Excellence that focuses on, you know, what you want to go into, forensics, cryptography, algorithms, um, you know, whatever your specialty is. You do not have to. I have not done any focused area. I only did the requirements. We just rebuilt our forensics class, and I'm going to go back next year in 2018 and redesignate uh, for forensics. I don't think I'll get anything special, but I'm going to fill out all of the information to redo our forensics piece. Um, the Air Force Base literally is across the street from us, and that's what they would like to see. They would like us to do a little bit more with cryptography and a little bit more forensics. So I am going to try to meet their needs. All right. <clears throat> so in order to go throughout this process, like I mentioned before, we actually have to start going through all of these knowledge units. Now, I wish I could show you a little bit more on my page. I'm going to log into it here in a second. But mine's already completed and we're a CAE school, so mine doesn't look like this. It doesn't have the start and continue options and so on. But let's say you're going to start mapping everything out. You're going to have all of your knowledge units. Right? This is where you actually start filling out all of the information. Also, Mark, how are we doing on time? Um, you have 20 minutes until 11. Okay. 
All right. So I'm going to try to finish up here in the next 10 minutes and because I'd like for some discussion. Um, All right. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So pick, for instance, in this walkthrough, he picks network storage devices. And in here, this is where you have to map everything out. So this is an IT systems component. And then this is where you have to actually look at the knowledge unit to provide students with an understanding of the basic components of information technology system and their roles in system operation with a key focus on network storage devices. Well, that's when you need to look at, is it mapped to a course you've already entered? Hopefully you did all that homework and you entered everything in the website. So you can just hit yes. And then everything from here on out is drop downs. You would select yes, the course you want it mapped to, and then it magically populates all of your you know, topic one, topic two, you know, he's got to mention by week, you know, like we cover cryptography in this week and that week. And then he can basically pick, you know, um, I believe the network plus has got a whole set, a system on storage devices, network storage devices and SANs and NASs and all that kind of stuff. So you just pick the chapter and then you just pick the uh, subject objectives Right, because normally if you pick a chapter, then you narrow it down into the network devices. And then you have to fill out justification. The justification field is where you actually write um, in week two, students read and research different types of network storage devices and implementation tools and they do homework five, which is identifying MAC addresses on local SANs. I don't know, I just made that up. But that's essentially what you put in that justification box. And then you do that for every single one of the knowledge units. So not only all 11 knowledge unit areas, but all of the sub areas of every point discussed. So what does that look like? That looks something like this. Okay, let's see, add. Okay, so as you can see, all of mine are already completed, but let's take for instance, We'll go back to the network concepts. I hope everybody can see this okay. But for the network concepts, take for instance, network architectures, LANs and WANs. I use that in my Network Plus class. It's talked about in these two chapters. I don't really need to give justification because network architecture, LANs and WANs, and then, you know, those are the topics. Justification normally is used here if it's not discussed in the book and you have like a third party website you use to help define it. And then it gets into the major topics. So yet again, installing physical major, you know, uh, advanced networking devices and so on. And as you can see, it starts adding more information. So here's another major topic. Network fundamentals, it's mapped to. Then you can see my justification. In week three of CIS 1130, students read chapter three. Chapter three key points include identifying different types of network topologies and communication types. Then students complete a hardware lab where students determine hardware devices that are uh, given their functions. And then the sections also has quizzes that cover fundamental concepts and technologies. Right. You do that for every single knowledge unit and point for all 11 outcomes. Like I mentioned, this is heavy. Here's the classes that I've mapped to, and here is all of the 11 areas. Okay. For sake of time, I'm going to go to the next couple steps here and get into program criteria. Now, 
as you can imagine, I've been to training things that have spoken eight hours on knowledge units, so I tried to get it down <laughs> as quickly as I could within a few minutes. Um, this last part is uh, program criteria. Program criteria is the area that I think people forget about the most, and it's normally the reason why people do not get their CAE designation. People spend a year plus working on the knowledge unit mapping. It doesn't take a year, but that's just, you know, everybody works in education, they know what it's like. It's this program criteria that everybody seems to get caught up in. Now, if you apply and all of your knowledge units look great, you can pass your knowledge units and still go back and redesignate if your program criteria didn't meet their requirements. Program criteria may be more scrutinized than the actual knowledge unit mapping. A lot of people spend a lot of time talking about knowledge unit mapping, but program criteria, which is you have to have an identified cyber defense curriculum path. We have two degrees and two short-term certificates that's filed in. We have to do student skill development and assessment. We have to have a center, a physical, it doesn't have to be a physical, but it can be a physical or online cybersecurity center. We have to have a cyber faculty qualifications that has to meet that Department of Defense 8075 or 8570, um, you know, CISSP, Security Plus, uh, Masters in Information Security Assurance. Um, then number five, cyber defense and multiple disciplinary practices at your institution. Institutional security plan. So our CIO had, uh, well, he already makes a whole institutional security plan. So we had to meet and discuss that with him so we could submit it. And, act, and the last one is cyber outreach collaboration beyond the institution. So this is hackathons. This is Cyber Patriot, Cyber Warrior Princess. This is all of those pieces. Now, all of that, again, is listed here on the CAE2Y page, or back at the NIETP page. And this is where it gets kind of heavy. You have to have a letter from your president. You have to have a letter of intent before you can even go to the next steps. This letter of intent endorsement is very important. You have to have all of that go through before you can start working on your defense curriculum path. And as you can see, all of these have sub areas. Cyber defense program of study, student participation, and you have to show that it's been going for three years. It has to be alive for three years to show evidence. Uh, curriculum uh, program path identifiers, nice framework crosstalk. That's what I was talking about before. That's already handled in your, um, when you start in aligning KUs. Uh, student skill development and assets. Uh, this gets into um, oh, making sure that there's presentations, making sure that you actually hand out an award, um, that you actually identify those students. You have to show pictures of labs and online resources, and you have to give them access so they can log in and look at your Wiley Labs or your Net. Um, we use the NDG Labs. Uh, we have to give them access so they can log in to all of that. Um, student participation um, in uh, competitions and so on. Um, Make sure that all of your faculty meet uh, the qualifications. There's a whole list of qualifications faculty have to meet. You have to have a program study of head uh, and so on. There, there is a lot of information here. And like I mentioned before, some schools do an amazing amount of work and their knowledge units are great. However, they fail to meet all of these seven institutional programs. Take, for instance, we have to have a current CAE2Y school website, and we have to maintain it, and it has to be reviewed and updated and all that kind of stuff. And of course, business advisory teams and so on. This is really important. This document right here is a very high overview of how to do the CAE2Y designation. I use this as a checklist. I use this as I did this, I did this, 
I met all these, you know, I did this designation, I did the letter. I used it as my daily checklist. All right, and real quick, in the last couple seconds, is YCA2Y. Here really soon, the Nash, um, was it the NSF, said that they're only going to be looking at schools that have the CAE2Y in order to uh, file for grants, especially in the cybersecurity uh, arena. Um, I applied for the uh, White House's uh, Cyber National Action Plan, which um, it's got up to like $3 million per school. And as you can imagine, there's only like 215 schools that have this designation. So it's not like you're competing against a very large amount of people. Um, I got $400,000 worth of servers and hardware to play around with for students. Um, I was able to upgrade all of my networks and all of my classrooms with uh, just one of these grants. Um, University of Cincinnati is also on this grant, and they also gave us a whole bunch of money for 20 students to have full scholarships to go through Sinclair and into the University of Cincinnati. So there is a lot of really cool concepts uh, with this. All right, and just before I lose my voice, uh, Mark, I didn't know if you want to turn it over for any questions. Um, no questions yet. I have a question. I don't know if you cover this or not, but how long, once you get it, how long does it last? Do you have to renew it again? It should be five years. It's a, it's a five-year process. So take, for instance, here's mine. I just got it. It's through 2022. Okay. And they have changed the way that you redesignate. They're starting to do yearly reports. And I think what they're trying to do is say, if you complete your yearly report, you may not have to redesignate. Oh, that's good. Okay. I sure hope they do that. And how long did it take you, this whole process for, for you at, at Sinclair, how long did it take, roughly, once you decided so you it, wanted to do it? It, it took a year. Um, and Sinclair gave me three hours of reassigned time uh, per term to complete this. So I had full institution uh, involvement. And, and I was working on my master's, and I just took over the chair. We have 1,800 students. I have 12 full-time faculty members, 48 programs. So well, it, was, it was a lot. Um, but, you know, not, not knowing um, what I was getting into and how to do it and how to go through this, I was so confused when I started this program. Like, I spent months filling out that Excel document thinking that's what I was going to submit, but it's not. You put all your information in the NIETP page, you just, you, you just use the Excel document to help you map. Well, I was treating it for months like that's what I was gonna hand in. So that's, I got really frustrated with that. So things like that, just, you know, you might have setbacks or, you know, I fought with a school forever to get a CAE2I web page and, you know, coming up with a ceremony and having marketing design their own um, handouts and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's the little things that you didn't think that were going to slow you down that ended up slowing me down. It wasn't the mapping, you know, because since, you know, I'm the chair and I got a whole bunch of faculty members, we're able to sit down and work on our curriculum fine with no, with no questions asked. But when you start looking at the institutional things, the stuff that you can't control, uh, it gets a little complicated. Uh, there's one question. Um, the three-year requirement is after you know that you meet all the KUs? Um, the three-year requirement has to do with the, uh, let's see if I can find it again. Um, the three-year requirement was, I think you have to have an active program for three years. You have to have three years worth of uh, information stating that your program has had graduates. Now, with that said, there is, yeah, right here. Curriculum path must have been in existence for at least three years. Evidence must show one year of students completed the curriculum path with, resignation, with recognition. 
So take for instance, if you started a cyber program last year, and you have students um, finishing this year, by the time you apply would be that end of that third year. Um, but it does say that the path has to meet all KUs, right? Right, right. So when you go to map it out, um, your curriculum path must have met all of those KUs before you were designated. Does that make sense? So let's say if tomorrow you're like, I'm, I'm going to be a CAE2Y school. And then you go to apply for it and you found out that your program didn't meet the qualifications over the last year, that, that'll set you back. You'll have to go back and change all of those qualifications in those classes. But like I said, hopefully everybody is already meeting all these KUs. You just have to map it. Any other questions, anyone out there? It's quite a process. I guess anything government-wise is. But as soon as we got it, we uh, filed for two grants, we got them. I mean, almost instantly. I mean, then that gets into the importance of why you would want to have this. You know, it, it gets into the, you do all of this work, Students may or may not know what in the world this designation is. And we promote it everywhere. It's on our LinkedIn pages, it's on our Facebook, it's on our Twitter, it's, I try to get it everywhere. I don't know if I gain students that way, but I gain employer recognition, employer um, involvement, and funds to support what I want to do here in our curriculum in our department. Uh, there's one more follow-up question. Um, so for instance, if we are currently lacking in something, it will be three years before we can qualify. Is that what that means? That's, that's how I take that, right? So let's say you did all of this, except you didn't have scripting. Scripting is one of the ones that people have a hard time with, and we did too, because you know we tried to talk to the programming department and that didn't work out. Um, so we had to make sure that all of our curriculum met those pieces. If not, I think it would have set us back. So if you are lacking, it may set you back. And that's why they really want you to look over all of these tools, use all of these resources. You know, you can get a mentor that will come in and review all of your information to let you know whether you should apply or not. I mean, that mentor process is amazing. I mean, they'll come in, they'll look over all your information, they'll look over whether or not you can kind of make it work, if that makes sense. And, and the reason why I'm saying make it work is we had a homework that I didn't think would meet the requirements for, um, for like the database part, because we had students go out to websites and look at you know, the security vulnerability web pages, and that actually met the requirements for students analyzing data, right? I would have never thought that. But my mentor came in and said, oh, no, you have it right there. I was like, oh, you know, that was in a different class, added that module in. It was something that we've been doing for the last three years, so it met the requirement. But if you have a mentor that comes in and lets you know what to work on, what you can do, what you can't do, and they will be, they'll be straight up honest with you whether they think you should apply now or make the changes and apply later. I mean, they're great. Okay, well, Kyle, our hour is up. Um, I thank you for your time and your preparation for this. It's, it's great, great presentation. Everyone seems to have liked it a lot. Um, I just put the survey link out on the chat box. If you see that, click on it and take the survey. Otherwise, I will email it to you uh, with the recording link so you can have that to share and pass around as you, as you like. Any, any last thoughts, um, Kyle, before we let you go? Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to your resource center. 
and to sign up for the mentor. Um, I am more than happy if anybody wants to call me or whatever, but having a mentor that will come out and redo all of your programs, your documentation, all of your class syllabuses and let you know, that, that is the best resource out there. All right. Well, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on the call. We appreciate your time as well. Hope this was useful. Please do the survey, and uh, have a good Thanksgiving holiday, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Kyle. You're welcome.